Ah, that stuff's so good. Absolutely love it. I feel like this morning that we need to pray for an offering, uh, especially with the first part of that video. Um, and so I do actually, I'm serious about that a little bit. So, um, you know, keep, keep in mind, church, that as we go through these times and as we are part of this um, journey together, God calls us and God notices. I mean, one of the things you can learn out of that, that first part of that video was that Jesus took notice of who gave and who did not. I, I am not, I'm not, please don't hear me from a pastoral point of view, only from a biblical point of view. And so as we spend this time together, always remember that um, you, are, you are part of the kingdom. And the kingdom requires that you give and that you, that you give unto the Lord, the first fruits. And so uh, elevate him. That's the whole idea about really on Palm Sunday, especially as they elevated Jesus as he came into the Jerusalem, the holy city. And they, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. I mean, this, these, were, these were great praises. And so uh, be mindful of that. And um, uh, one more thing, just to, as a quick reminder, uh, they may have already caught this. Uh, sometimes with Facebook Live and, uh, and even Zoom, as we go through this, this experience of, of online stuff, they drop off. And it's not, all, it's not our fault necessarily that we have technical difficulties. Sometimes it's just the Facebook. Just stay on. Don't panic. Don't, don't get just... Make sure that you stay together. We'll, we'll reset and uh, try to get it back as quick as we can. So just in case. And then if, if it all fails, we have this recorded on our website, and it go, goes on about noon. So um, I, I want you to play with me just as we, as we come before God. Father, thank you so much as we are a blessed to be able to come before you in prayer already this morning as you have had countless people praying for us. Praying for us as a church, people online on phone calls with the prayer team and, and, and Brother Sean and, and people across the globe. I'm, I'm thinking of, of Ken and Don Bishop, and they prayed for us, and the Lord just shout out to them as missionaries. Um, Lord, we, we sometimes don't realize how many people we have praying for us, loving on us, caring for us. And most of all, Lord Jesus, you're interceding for us. So may the word go out today, not in, in just for knowledge's sake, but for application. May you apply this to our heart. May there be something special as we celebrate the beginning of this holy week, as we celebrate our, our, our Lord, the King of Kings, as he comes and he has come into our own heart. Truly a powerful, triumphal entry. So Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, have your way. Come. And be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope that you have your elements ready. And as we begin to, this Palm Sunday, begin to uh, embark on, on some scripture. Jesus has already um, come into Jerusalem where I'm going to pick up today. And uh, as you saw in the videos. So this Palm Sunday begins with, uh, with a strange occurrence for us. Um, but it's a beautiful occurrence. Two of them, in fact. Uh, awkward, no doubt about it, uh, but nonetheless, they are worthy of, of our attention as you have, have, are scratching your head saying, where does this go with, with this Palm Sunday? Um, take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 12 as well and hold your finger in Mark chapter 14. Let me, let me ask you how, many have you, how many of you have watched uh, uh, things on TV uh, while we are uh, locked in and locked down? that you would have never watched, ever. At some point, you find yourself a little bit dumbfounded the fact that you, you're on some program and you have, you have no idea how you got there. True disclosure, if I may, this morning, Robin and I did the day, really more me than Robin, but she had to be on the same train as I was anyway. So we actually watched Frozen. Now, I, and we didn't have any grandkids with us. We didn't have anybody with us. We were, it was just an advertisement on there, and I clicked on it. Next thing you know, we are, we're singing along with Elsa and Anna, and, and there you go. And so we, not something that we normally do, but at some point in time, you have to uh, just give in, and you start watching things. Uh, some of us have done things outside the normal part of our routine, I guarantee it. In fact, maybe you're walking, and you've, in fact, this is the first time that you're walking ever. And, uh, but you want to get outside, you're doing things. 
thank goodness for all those who are making phone calls. Um, we still have room for more. Uh, they're creating memories, realizing that the joy of connecting with God's people is great. And even in spite of every now and then, a little bit of a different phone number than we gave them initially. Hopefully they're divine appointments, but you never know. And so blessings to those who have, those who have been calling and, and just connecting. We, we just want you to know, church, we love you. And we want everybody to connect and stay connected over the, at least the next month. And uh, as we journey together, as we travel together on, on many different languages and, and um, across the globe, because we have people from all over everywhere. So it is fun. It is incredible what God is doing. Well, let's join me on this as we read these scriptures today, as we look at these, these great events that happened that teach us powerfully as we celebrate our Lord and our Savior's victorious entry into the holy city and a day when our salvation, if you will, began to be revealed, and yet a day our Savior began a journey like no other to the harsh Roman cross. And so before he gets there, we find ourselves in Mark chapter 12. And I'm going to narrate, since we've already had the scripture read to us and acted out before, so I'm going to kind of narrate what's going on a little bit here. Jesus is sitting outside the treasury. It's situated in the women's court of the, of the temple, and so it's outside about 200 square feet, if you will. It's surrounded by a colonnade, and, and Jesus is there strangely watching offerings being given. So I know that God is using this time for a teaching so our Savior is using this to, to get a point across. But I'm, I'm not sure it's all about tithes and offerings, which most pastors will preach out of this. Uh, and, it's, and it's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. Because um, there's great points for sure. But I don't know if that's what the Lord is going to do and what he's going to give us. Let me just highlight these, though, just real quick, what I think, what most of the time pastors are going to preach about. One is, it's never about the amount of money, because you're going to read that pretty quickly. And you're going to say, well, this is really about giving of, of our offerings and our tithes. Well, it's never about the, the giving or the amount. It's about the heart. That's a great truth out of this passage. I think another one is trust in God with, with what you have or what you don't have. Because the woman gave very little, I mean, yet it was all that she had. And yet those who gave a whole lot, which typically we go, oh my, oh my, look how much they gave, really didn't even bother them at all, and, and it really wasn't from a good heart condition. I think also understanding that giving is worship to God. Probably one of the greatest lessons that's in here, that worship through giving not just finances, but giving out of our, our lives is worship to God, and it's so good. But I hear, here's what I believe we begin to look at in the main truth in this passage, because Jesus very intentionally calls the disciples. He is calling you and me because it's all for them. It's all for us. It's a lesson to them. Listen, what, look what verse 43 says. Calling his disciples, which just simply has to under, we have to understand that is a point of, of, look, guys, I need you to come and, and pay attention. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Verse 44, they gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. And she did this, if I may, she did this in full view of everybody. I mean, that was, that was a big deal. I'm sure that there were probably some people who mocked her and said, well, you, don't, you know, she didn't give hardly anything. But, that's, but Jesus recognizes that she gave all that she had. She gave everything that she could give. And so maybe our, our observation, if you will, our, our lesson here today is living in the commitment to Jesus requires us to live our faith before others. She gave everything she had. She did it before everybody else. Listen, don't let that, that slip away. It's a very important point. Our commitment requires that we live our faith before the people. That, that really is a telling thing. It's not about all about, anyway, giving your finances. Again, it's a great 
lifestyle and it's right before God. But in this moment, Jesus is teaching that through the life of an, of an unknowing widow, she had no idea, catch that, she had no idea that God was watching her. She had no idea. But there's a lesson about his own life. Because catch this. She gave all that she had three days before our Savior gave all that he had. Isn't that incredible? So maybe there was the picture that Jesus is painting. There is a reason why we randomly see our Savior sitting in the, you know, at the treasury place, looking out and, and, and watching what's going on because he was going to give everything he had. And so he calls us to drop in on this moment. There really was no reason for him to be there. But just to teach a lesson. Maybe through the time of giving like this, maybe the treasury in Jerusalem at Jesus' time, maybe the offering plate as it goes or the offering boxes as we use, be, tend to reveal the human heart. Tend to just expose where we are, the souls of what we're thinking, of what we're doing that is seen by our God. Maybe there is something powerful here that we need to also embrace, this teaching. How much are we really living and loving and committed to God? Because sometimes when you get to this point, giving of our finances is a tough, tough go. And so probably this is where Jesus understood that the heart was going to be reflected. How much of, of your commitment really is right here? How much do you really love the Lord? I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not browbeating this, if I may, for tithes and offerings. That's not what it is. But it does expose our commitment. So the teaching of disciples was all about how Jesus would give everything to the Father. And that's what you need to walk home with. Keep this in your mind as, as we journey through this, this passage. Everything for his people Jesus gave. Everything for his people. Everything he was about. Everything he had. Just like this poor widow. Everything that he had to live on. He gave for the sins of the world. Your sin. My sin. And so it's not unlike the disciples not to get this, of course. They didn't understand the calling Jesus had on his life, and they've argued with it and over it for, for three years now. And even though he tried to share it over and over and over at this point, they didn't get it. But, but don't be hard on the disciples, because I wonder ourselves at times. Do we get it? Do we really understand that Jesus gave everything? Well, here's the picture that Jesus wants us to see that this widow gave everything for her commitment to God because Jesus was going to give everything in his commitment to God. His sacrifice for our sins, his rejection for our reconciliation, his earthly end for our eternal relationship. Do we get that? Are we, are we grabbing onto that? Because I think that's important for us. Well, let's leave this encounter, if I may, and unpack our second intimate encounter this morning, which is in Mark chapter 14. And it starts out this way. And verse 3 says, while in Bethany reclined at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. So this woman comes in to the house. She breaks this jar. No doubt the perfume was very, very um, beautiful in smell, and it just sifted across the room. And people began to wonder, and they, people began, my goodness, that's a year's wages. And so there was some great upheaval with this encounter that, that Jesus had with this woman. People in the room didn't like it, and they missed the importance of the lesson because oftentimes... <laughs> We miss, we miss the obvious. 
We, 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 maybe it's we think of the obvious. Maybe it's we, we, we instantly rush to the obvious like, wow, that was really expensive and you broke it, you blew it. But maybe the not so obvious is what we need to be paying attention to. And, and so she used, if I may, in, in, the, in the room, she wasted this jar, this beautiful jar. She broke it. And now the perfume's out and she wasted it on Jesus, right? Well, no, of course she did not. And so we're told in verse 6, leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Did, I want you to catch that. It's the most important phrase, I believe, in my whole message. She has done a beautiful thing to me, Jesus said. Who wouldn't want our God, our Savior, to say such as that about us? She has done a beautiful... Mike has done a beautiful thing for me. And that's what's so special about this encounter, and I think the other encounter as well. And so I think there's a lesson here, an observation that Jesus is revealing to us to be a people of faith, you and I, people who believe. And if you're not quite there yet, you're not yet a believer in Jesus, and you're watching this, you're seeing this online, just I still want you to catch this, because here's the encounter. The people of faith, who are desirous to do a beautiful thing for him that must be lived out. It must be lived out. It cannot be done by our, our own private monastery or in our own private monastery. We have to be willing and reckless before the world with our actions toward revealing Jesus. I, here, I want you to catch the picture of this because both of these women... A widow who went to the treasury had no idea she was being watched by God. Maybe her faith told her and taught her the theology that God sees all things. But at that moment, I guarantee she had no idea that Jesus, God, was watching her. And this woman, we're not told who it is. There's some people who think it's, it's Mary. But nonetheless, we're not told in the Gospel of Mark. And it's not that important was not worried about anybody else in the room. She entered the, the house. Maybe she was comfortable there or whatnot. Nonetheless, recklessly, she breaks this jar. Doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. She is taking everything she had to give to Jesus. She's doing something beautifully special for him. So we have to live it out loud. We have to do it in the public arena we all tend to sense time is running out. There's something happening across our globe. And, and today as we sit here, and, and the, I don't know what the number is to the, this morning, but I know it's well over 60,000 plus people have passed away. More than that, those are just from the virus that we're dealing with. And it is something happening. And we sense a time, at least I hope you do, sense that there's something unstable in our world. There's an increase of evil, an escalation, if I may, even of human knowledge that seems to be running amok. And there's actually a surge of we don't really need God. We don't need a Savior. In fact, this generation, I know, probably knows less about God and less about salvation than most generations. And there's something strange that's going on. And maybe it's going to be the, the reality that, we're, that Jesus is coming soon. And I don't know, and I don't want to get into that. But there is something that we need to sense as God's people. So here's a calling to us in our lives to be doing something beautiful for God, reckless for God powerfully, I don't even know what, I want to, what other adjectives I want to say. Because the wording is so perfect, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Verse 8 says, she poured perfume on his body beforehand to prepare for Jesus' burial. To prepare for his burial. Almost a prophetic action, if you will, to declare what was going to happen she did all that she could 
She did all that she could, Jesus said. It wasn't in her power to avert the great sacrifice that Jesus was going to give, which was foreordained before the foundations of the world, nor even to slow it down for a single day. In fact, this woman did all, all she did really was to highlight the victory that was to be accomplished by our Savior. Highlight the fact that he was going to die, but then in his death, he would rise again. She did all that she could, all that she had. She didn't try to manufacture anything. Hear me now. Hear me now. She didn't try to manufacture anything out of the ordinary. She just gave out of her belongings all that was available to her, all to bring glory to Jesus. I think that no doubt this is what James was speaking of when he tells us in his, his writings, in his book to us, in his letter to us, James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action is dead. Faith by itself, if, if you're not going to have any actions, really isn't faith at all, it's dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith, James says, without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. It's just a recklessness of just doing things for God because you love him. And we need to do all that we can to glorify God by doing things because we love him. Don't lose sight of this. Don't get lost in the weeds. In both of these encounters, the women gave me everything to God through their own personal sacrifice, what they had, what they had. So here's my observation. God doesn't need us to be anything special, but to just be who we are with what we have, where we live, and use it to glorify him. That's it. The Holy Spirit called both of these women to glorify our Savior. Neither one of them had any idea what they were doing. There wasn't an intentionality to get written down in the Bible at all. But simply to glorify the Lord. All to tell us and to, to, to preview for us, if you will, that Jesus was going to give all he had. All for humanity. Out of what he could give. In his own humanity. And I think the ultimate comment would be that God called Jesus to reconcile humanity back with God. That was it. That was the point. To reconcile you and me and all those who have been before us and all those who are going to come after us back to the Father so that the Father would be glorified. So here's the great truth. Once again, neither of these women thought they would impact anyone with what they were doing. They simply did it because of their faith in God. And that's our lesson today, I think. And just a reminder, just so that you can have some strength from what I'm saying, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, that which you are very familiar with, I'm sure, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So simply, why do we do good works? To glorify our Father in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells us these words. We are God's workmanship. Here you go. You are God's workmanship. God's doing a great thing in you. Created in Christ Jesus for good deeds, for good deeds, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Created for his glory and created for good deeds because it is by our good deeds that God gets glory. Isn't that a great verse? Isn't that just powerful for us today? The very fact that we watch these women give out of, and, and glorify God, we should be following the example to give all that we have, to do a beautiful thing for God, for our Savior. So the natural pathway to this is how do we make this happen? How do we, how do, we do this ourselves? How do we join in? Well, you know what? I thought long and hard about this this week because I really wanted to be able to give you some practical, hey, do these things. And you know what? And then God kept telling me, stop. Stop. You're trying to manufacture something. 
You're trying to say something that really isn't. And, and, and I, I felt like God finally said this, Mike, just say these words. So here they are. I'm trying to give you the best I got. Here it is. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit how you can personally glorify God. It's going to come in a way you're probably not even expecting it. In fact, my guess is that you've done it already before, and you still have no idea that you did anything to glorify God. But it might have been a simple deed that somebody caught. And, so, and God said, way to go. But you know what? We weren't even listening for it. We weren't even paying attention to it. So ask the Holy Spirit. Seek the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Ask him, God, what, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live this out? What are you, where, where should I go? What should I be doing? I mean, we need to be more in tune with the Holy Spirit and listening to him. And then, of course, naturally, knock. Ask, seek, and knock. Knock on doors, try things, do things. Do it with the intent that I'm going to do this to glorify God. Not that you want to try to manufacture anything, but be intentional about, God, I love you today. I want to do something for you. I want to... I want to do a beautiful thing for you today. And you begin to knock on the doors. Just try things that, that you've not tried before. It started out with the idea that some of the, some of the church members are calling you, and they'll keep calling you uh, for uh, the next month or two, if we have to, just to love on you, to keep you connected. This is not their normal pattern. It's very unique, very difficult. So just love on them as they call. Begin maybe with your sphere of influence. I don't know. Just try it with your friends. Do something in your workplace or maybe your neighborhood. That's all I got. Trust the Holy Spirit. On this beautiful day that we celebrate Jesus getting on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem, so outside of the norm. But a beautiful thing that Jesus did for God the Father. And we'll celebrate this Friday coming up a, a service called Good Friday, time where we mourn the death of Jesus, and then we'll celebrate on Easter next Sunday the fact that Jesus is alive, and he rose again, and we're going to have a great time celebrating that. I want you to pray with me as we begin this time of communion. Father, may we embrace this teaching to do a beautiful thing for you. I mean, maybe there's something now that you begin to speak into our hearts individually that, that we need to unleash, that we need to uh, be reckless about. Oh, I, I, these women didn't even think that they were being reckless necessarily. They were just doing what they felt and they knew was right. God, let it, that be in us. But maybe first today, we also need to pay attention to where we are, or maybe we have gone astray. And you tell us in your word that we need to be careful and be mindful of the times that when we take these elements, we, we take this bread and we take this cup, the Apostle Paul reminds us very clearly that we are to come before you and make sure there is nothing within us that is hindering our relationship with you. So we pause right now just for a moment. And with your family or with your friends or whoever you're watching this with, will you pause just for a moment and ask God, where in my life am I in sin? Or where am I in my life am I wrong? And you deal with him on this. And you ask for forgiveness. The Apostle John reminds us that if we are willing to confess our sins, that God's faithful and just to forgive us. Let us not eat in an unworthy manner or drink the cup in an unworthy manner. So we confess ourselves to you, O oh God, in this moment. There are families, Lord, that are, that are 
are thinking about this right now. Husbands and wives sitting in the same room. That maybe you haven't confessed even to each other. Help them to confess to you, oh God. There are those who are sitting alone as they watch. Holy Spirit, will you strengthen them to be accountable to you? We ask, O oh Lord, that you would sanctify this, this bread, that you would sanctify this cup, that you would sanctify what's going on in the homes right now, O oh God. That this would be a very intimate time, a powerful time, where we can come before you and commune with you, that we can hear you as you speak to us. Lord, let us be reverent in this sacred moment. Holy Spirit, come and be with us. Lord Jesus, make yourself known. While you're in front of your screen, wherever you are, I just want you to keep your head bowed just for a moment. I want to read to you why we do what we do. We talk about the elements. We talk about the the bread as a body of, of Jesus that was broken for us and the blood that was spilled. Peter reminds us these words, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus, a lamb without blemish. And he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was only revealed in these last times for our sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, Love for one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the ever-living and enduring word of God in Christ Jesus. The fact that we take this bread, the body of our Lord and Savior, who reminds us that on the night that he was betrayed, he gave thanks and broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread. Take what you have. And take in Jesus and his life for you. Eat all of it. And in the same way, it says, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, wherever you drink or however it goes down, do it in remembrance of me. Jesus died for our sins as the precious blood of the sacrificial lamb slain for us that we might have reconciliation with the Father. When you drink this, this is a beautiful thing to do for our God. Give him your heart. Give him your soul. Give him everything. Drink. Drink all of it and be thankful. Lord, we honor you. We thank you. We give you praise. That we serve a living God who is not, who's not dead, who's not in the grave, but there's only one God. And Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the life. And you remind us that no one comes to the Father except through you. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be partners, heirs to the throne. That we get to receive not the perishable, but the imperishable, the eternal life. May we go out this day 
and this week to come. However we are to live, may we do a beautiful thing for you, oh God. A beautiful thing, even in our worship, as we sing together, church, as we close this out.